Yay, welcome back everyone. I have to say, um, I am sensing a lot of optimism in uh, Dave DiCello's photographs. Uh, look at, you know, there's like sunshine or whatever this is, sunset, sun in any case. So, uh, you know, look out the window too. It feels like winter is gonna be over at some point. Um, all right, so let's see, we are, um, we are a week away from uh, research project proposals. And I wanted to remind you of that in case you had forgotten, not that I think you had forgotten, but just to remind you of that. Um, and the um, a few of you have reached out to run sort of your ideas by me yeah, and, and that's great. And I'm happy to do that. If you have doubts or whatever questions, just ping me or, or stay after class or whatever uh, and talk to me or before class or talk to me separately. But the, um, so Tuesday next week, we will have a uh, class meeting dedicated only to these project proposals as presentations. So uh, we are however many of us here and we'll each take about five minutes or so to present as a presentation Right, so you know that means slides and whatnot. Uh, present our research project ideas, uh, and we're gonna like discuss those as a group. That's the plan for Tuesday next week. Okay, and if you have doubts or questions about what the research project could be, should be, might be, just talk to me. I'm happy to help with with that. Okay, so for today, I'd like to talk about uh, survey designs. Uh, I think it's a very nice sort of. Uh, closure ending, if you will, to the series of, of discussions we've had about interviews, uh, because there's a lot of stuff uh, in here that I think also relates to how you would formulate questions in an interview and some of the biases that um, affect the survey responses also are, are, are shared by interviews. So it's a good sort of transition uh, piece towards the, the more quantitative part of the class uh, starting, I think, next week or, or on Thursday already. So we're not gonna talk about Grandi theory, um, but hopefully you've had a good sense of the, what that is about and isn't about from the readings I, I asked you to look at. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to discuss those. If you have questions about any of that, uh, feel free to, to just ask me. Uh, we, we could talk about that. But what I'd like to do today is, mm -hmm. oops, is put the right window in focus so I can click on it. All right, and, and then, um, talk about survey. So we're going to be following a few chapters from this book. Um, I put the readings, uh, a PDF of, uh, of the readings in the same Google Drive folder that uh, hopefully you're used to by now uh, under, I don't know, surveys or survey design or something. So you could find all of the details of this uh, there and, and you could read more, more about this uh, outline. But what I'd like to do is um, tell you a little bit about how to design surveys. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time towards the end to dissect one, I think, good survey instrument together. And so talk about what makes that a good instrument and, and maybe what doesn't, what are some, some weaknesses of it. Okay, any, any thoughts on any of this before I get into it? Okay, so why surveys? Maybe the number one reason why you might want to do a survey is to answer um, the prevalence style questions. If you want to know how prevalent some particular phenomenon is or practices or whatever, um, surveys are a great way of, of doing this. Yeah, you'll see sort of why I'm calling this so, sort of prevalence. There's some caveats here, but by and large, surveys are a great way of getting a sense of how common or uncommon something is, whether it occurs in, in the wild in some population or what have you. Uh, surveys are a great way of doing this. So there's lots of research questions. Remember the lecture about formulating research questions? Lots of research questions around um, the presence or existence of some phenomenon, right? Um, often as precursors for more, um, I don't know, so for designing an, an intervention, for example, for, for that particular problem setting. Uh, 
And surveys are a great way of answering these kind of uh, prevalence or existence style questions. Uh, that's one. Two, also a great way um, of collecting data that would allow you to answer uh, to relationship style questions. So again, like looking back at the lecture about how to formulate research questions, different kinds of research questions. Uh, remember there were questions um, around how, relationships between variables. Surveys are a great way of collecting data to answer those kinds of questions. Um, whenever that kind of data is not available through other means, or for example, when you're looking to triangulate data that you've collect, collected through other means, uh, just to get more confidence that whatever you're observing uh, is actually true, it actually holds. Um, and finally, I'll give you one example um, of um, a way in which surveys might be good for actually studying uh, differences among subpopulations. So here, for example, you could, uh, I guess uh, it's one instance of this would be to think of this as you know, relationships between variables. So for example, um, maybe there's one variable in your survey that you're collecting that um, yeah, tells you which subpopulation the responses are coming from. You know, are they coming from CMU students or are they coming from, I don't know, uh, MIT students or Stanford students or whatever, uh, right? So you could, you could collect variables about the university the students are at and you know, that would allow you to break down your data into, um, into subpopulations and sort of you know, study um, relationships between variables among those uh, separately. But also just as an idea, as an example, something we did ourselves um, in our group a while ago, you could, um, for example, if you're interested, um, let me be very concrete uh, to give you an example. We were um, interested in, in seeing um, why certain, um, open source contributors uh, disengage, why they stop contributing to open source projects. Uh, and we were particularly interested in uh, sort of how contributors of, of different gender uh, might uh, disengage for different reasons uh, from contributing to open source projects. Like one way in which we could study this um, is to design a survey instrument. So asking sort of relevant questions around this, but to, um, deploy that separately, so independently, to uh, contributors that we've identified as sort of having different genders. And so collect so independent data sets this way. Um, and so that would allow us to, um, for example, not just contrast um, um, or compute uh, study relationships between variables within those, uh, within those groups, but also to contrast, for example, things like response rates or non-response rates among uh, uh, respondents from those different groups. So you could, you could think of, sort of um, surveys also as a sort of study design uh, element, not just as a data collection uh, method. Okay? So hopefully this will become a little bit more concrete later on. All right, so the, the most common type of survey that you're probably used to is the so-called probability sample surveys. So these are the ones where um, the survey is being sent out to some random sample of, of people and there's some sort of information, some data collected this way. Um, and the goal of this, like the, or rather the strength of this, like why is this a good idea because generally you're able to, by only surveying a small sample of some population, you're able to make much more general inferences about that population as a whole. Okay, so think of, for example, how political polling uh, works. You're typically only surveying a small fraction of the population, but uh, you're able to make predictions and inferences about uh, the likelihood of some candidates winning the election, uh, for the entire population, for the entire country. Okay, so this is this is a huge strength of um, of these kind of um, probability sample surveys, right? The ability to generalize results to a whole population. Okay, um, and uh, so with this in mind, 
right? Your goal as designers of such instruments, so I'm going to call these survey, the, the thing, the questionnaires that people fill out, I'm going to call these instruments. Um, your goals as designers of these instruments, um, it, uh, your main goal is therefore to reduce the, the survey error, the difference between um, the estimates of some variables or whatever um, the, uh, computed on the survey data and the true value of those variables for the entire population that you're looking to describe. Okay, so this is your, your number one goal as designers of these survey instruments is to reduce the error between whatever you're measuring on this sample of, of responses that you're collecting um, between that and whatever the true value of those variables might be on the entire population. For example, with elections, right, your goal as a pollster is to reduce the error between whatever um, candidate seems most likely to win the election on some small sample and, and whatever uh, the entire population would end up voting for. Okay, that makes sense? So this is the main goal, is reducing the error between what you're observing on the small and what is the true value on the large, okay? Um, so there's uh, four types of errors that are gonna uh, make it hard for you to achieve this goal, okay? So uh, number one uh, has to do, um, so this is called coverage error. This has to do with the sampling frame. So um, the sampling frame is the, a set of people um, from which you are sampling um, your uh, survey participants, the people you're inviting to participate in your survey, right? You're sampling from some set of people. Okay? This set of people is called the sampling frame, the set of people you're sampling from. For example, uh, let's say I am, um, uh, interested in studying some property um, about open source developers, okay? And my sampling frame is all the people with GitHub accounts or, or all the people that have contributed to uh, open source projects on GitHub. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's this frame, the sampling frame, that's the set of people from which I'm sampling my um, survey participants. Those are uh, like, I would presumably be computing some kind of random sample or what have you from this large set of people and inviting those to, to participate in a survey. Okay, so coverage error here has to do with how um, much of the actual population of interest I am covering with my sampling frame. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means that in my example, uh, open source developers on GitHub, right? GitHub is not the only platform where people are um, developing open source software, right? So by only including GitHub contributors, users in my sampling frame, I have this coverage error here, right? Because I, I'm sort of, I have this blind spot, I'm missing out on all the other open source developers, however many or few they might be, that are not on GitHub. Does that make sense? This is called coverage error. It has to do with um, how much of the actual population is being represented in my sampling frame. Okay, then there's sampling error. Okay, so sampling error has to do with how many people from the sampling frame I'm actually surveying. Okay, so um, you know, for uh, general uh, political elections, uh, the pollsters are not surveying every single uh, individual with the right to vote in the United States, right? they are uh, surveying a sample of people, this, the same with any survey, okay? So how large or small or representative the sample is, obviously should have an impact on how 
large the error between whatever you're observing, you're measuring on, on the sample and whatever it might hold true for the entire population uh, is, okay? Then the, we could talk about um, non-response error. Okay, so obviously not everyone that you invite to participate in a survey is going to do that. Uh, you, I think you agree with this. All right, so some people will respond to your survey and some people won't. So this can be a problem if the people that do not respond to your survey turn out to have um, very different attributes, qualities, properties, what have you, compared to the ones that did end up responding. Because whatever inferences you're making then uh, based on the sample of uh, people that have responded is not gonna hold true of the entire population because the people that have not responded are very different, okay? But obviously this is not a problem if the people who are responding are very similar uh, to the people that are not responding but it could be a huge problem if they're not. And, and finally, uh, we could talk about measurement error. Okay, so um, here, the questions around how valid and, and reliable are the different things you're measuring using your survey. And I have lots of great examples. I uh, sort of fell down this rabbit hole uh, reading this book uh, that, I, that I mentioned uh, the other day. And so sort of, it was, uh, filled with these amazing examples um, of uh, possible uh, errors that have to do with measurement uh, from there. So I'll, I'll share some of those with you. Um, okay, so here's more, uh, more examples of all of these. So coverage error, remember, we talked about the sampling frame. So let's say uh, we're talking about um, random digit dial, uh, random digit dial telephone survey. This is sort of the most common way that uh, political polling was done before the, the internet, okay? Like you're, you're randomly dialing phone numbers um, and whoever um, you know, responds, you ask them questions and so on. This is your random sample of, of people, okay? So now the catch here is that um, by doing this, your sampling frame is, is people with landlines, right? So uh, what if people with landlines are very different from people without landlines? Whatever you're learning from these people with landlines or the sample, the sample of people with landlines that you end up inviting to your survey and end up responding, right? Whatever you're learning from this group may not generalize to people in general if the people without landlines are very different, okay? Um, and turns out they are quite different. So there's, you know, um, good research and literature on this to document um, many variables that are different between people with, with landlines and people without. For, for example, have to do with socioeconomic status. Uh, people with landlines tend to be wealthier. They, uh, that's the image here. There's a butler uh, sort of bringing your phone um, so you can, you can, I don't know, pick that up. Okay, so you can see how um, this could lead to coverage error. The, uh, another example, okay, let's say we are running an internet survey um, and we are interested in surveying either CMU students on the one hand or the entire US population. Okay, so if we're talking about CMU students, then it's very unlikely that there would be CMU students without internet access. Would you agree? So therefore your sampling frame is probably quite reliable here. If, if your target population is CMU students and your sampling frame consists of CMU students with internet access, it's probably a, a pretty decent uh, sampling frame with, uh, with little coverage error. Like most people in your target population would be in your sampling frame. 
right? Most EMU students, if not all, would have internet access. That's not the case if you're talking about the entire US population, for example, right? If your goal is to make inferences about the entire US population, but you're administering a survey to uh, using the internet, right? Survey Monkey or what have you, one of these Qualtrics things, uh, Google Forms, what have you, right? If you're administering an internet survey, um, then, um, right, necessarily, like your sampling frame there consists of people with internet access. And those will be different just in the same way and similar ways that people with landlines are different from people without. Those will be different from people without internet access. So your findings, right, uh, are restricted to so this um, this context that your your uh, sampling frame consists of. Okay. And okay, so this was about coverage error. Uh, let's look at sampling error. This is super, super fascinating. Um, I, I love this. So you will probably be surprised, un unless you've sort of thought about this before and uh, have seen this before. I suspect you might be surprised how few people you would need to survey to obtain estimates that have acceptable levels of precision of any population. So here's an example. Um, CMU has, I don't know, uh, around 14,000 students. Okay. So you, uh, if, if you're looking for um, a random sample of CMU students that is uh, representative of the entire population of CMU students with high confidence and low margin of error, right? these are so two measures, I'll come back to this in a minute two measures that are common uh, when you're constructing samples, you would need a random sample of about 2000 students, okay? right? So that seems like a lot, right? Relatively, like, you know, there's 14,000 students total. So you've reduced this by a factor seven, it's not, it's still a huge amount of people that you would need to, to have, right? Okay, so now what if, what if you wanna study the entire US population? You wanna make inferences about the entire US population. The entire US population, uh, 328 million people last I checked. Okay, like here's the amazing thing. A random sample of the entire US population with the same properties that I mentioned before, 95% confidence, 2% uh, margin of error, would consist, you ready? Of about of less than 2,400 people. So all you would need to add to your sample size to go from a population of 14,000 students to a population of 328 million people is about 300 people. Isn't that surprising? Okay, amazing. Um, and by the way, so you, you don't, this was maybe a very strict example. Uh, I, I had very, so, uh, very, I, I was looking for a very small margin of error. Uh, if, if you're uh, willing to tolerate slightly larger margin of error, um, for example, if you're willing to tolerate a 10% margin of error, Right, with the same confidence level, 95% confidence, all you would need is a random sample of less than 100 people. With a random sample of less than 100 people, you'd be able to make inferences of the entire US population with plus or minus 10% error. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Bogdan, I actually have a question. Uh, so how should we interpret uh, the 2% or 10% margin of error here? What does that mean? So I, I paid Bobo, you know, uh, I paid Bobo before to ask this question because I had like a slide ready to, to answer it, right? Uh, obviously, uh, that's how this works. Thank you for the question, Bobo. So uh, allow me to demonstrate. So the two measures uh, that we talked about, confidence level and, and confidence interval, 
uh, or, or margin of error. Confidence interval is the same as margin of error. Uh, there's some synonyms. So the, let's start with the margin of error. This is the plus or minus figure that you usually see reported with surveys of any kind, uh, estimates of any kind from, from surveys, uh, including the ones I had on the previous slide. Okay, so uh, lower is better here. You can imagine that, right? You wanna have as, as, as low as possible margin of error. So the way you interpret this is the following. Let's say you um, have a confidence interval or margin of error plus, of min plus or minus four, uh, okay? Let's, let's say you, you decide that ahead of time. That's, that's your acceptable margin of error. That's something you have to decide on ahead of time. So let's say um, with that decision, uh, you run some survey and 47% um, of your respondents uh, choose some answer X. Okay, 40% of your um, respondents say they would vote for some candidate, for example, or you know what have you. Okay, so then, then you can be sure, I'll come back to this in a second, you can be sure that if among your relatively small sample, 47% would choose answer X, then among the entire population from which you, you or for, for which you're looking to make inferences and from which you sampled, then, you can be sure that the entire population would choose, so, or, sorry, between uh, so 47 plus or minus 4% of the entire population would choose that same answer. So that's where the plus or minus comes from, right? So if on your sample, 47% of people say X, then in your population, you can expect between 43 and 51% of your people to say X. Okay, that's your, your confidence interval. Okay, so that's how you interpret this. Uh, if there are multiple answers, the answer is not binary, how should I interpret the result? Yeah, great question. Uh, we, we leave that as homework. That's good, that's a good question. Um, okay, so the other one here is the confidence level, we talked about the margin of error, the confidence level is how sure you can be. So here, um, the common ones are, you know, 95% confidence is the one you'll see most commonly used everywhere. It's the one that uh, is um, just, just like you see the, you know, uh, p-value thresholds of 5% of sort of arbitrarily chosen as the gold standard for, I don't know, uh, empirical research. In the same way, you will probably see 95% confidence level as the, the norm when, when doing any kind of sampling. So the way you interpret this is the following. So the confidence level um, represents how often the... Um, um, the true percentage of the population who would choose that answer X, whatever it might be, um, how often that true percentage lies within the confidence interval that you said before. So if, in other words, if I were to draw a different random sample, okay, this so tells me how often these new random samples that I keep drawing, um, for those, the true percentage would lie within that margin of error that I said before. Okay, so you can see here that you know, higher is better, right? So you'd, 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 want to, um, you'd want the true estimate to always be within that margin of error if possible, right? So that means sort of higher confidence level, but right? you can be more sure uh, but the, I guess the norm that people that often use is that you're 95% you're sure that if you were to redo this many, many times, uh, the true value would lie within that confidence interval. So that's kind of how you interpret this. Okay, so higher is better here, but 95% is common. And with the other one, lower is better, right? You want to have tighter bounds on your interval. Okay. Okay, so this was about sample. We talked about coverage error and we talked about sampling error. 
So there were two more that I mentioned before. So non-responsive. Sorry, sorry about. Uh, yeah. Please. So yeah. So I have a question. So, so I mean, ideally, like we might like. Uh, so, so ideally, I guess we are gonna like kind of set the confidence level and choose the confidence interval, and then we decide how many kind of uh, sample we want to have. But in practice, do we like do this first, or like just based on how many actual response we have? Super excellent question. Thank you, CJ. Yeah. So I, I think you nailed it. Ideally, you do the former. Right. If if you can, you set it ahead of time and then you you sample as many people as you need in order to reach that okay but if you cannot afford that for whatever reason it's still useful to you know plug the actual number in the number of the sample size you can in this i gave this example of uh, this is the one i use most often this is an online calculator you'll see the, the url there at the bottom it's the first hit you get on google if you google sample size calculator you can see in this how you can also plug in the number n, the sample size, right? So maybe you don't have the luxury of sampling more people for whatever reason, but you, but you could plug that in and sort of reverse engineer what these other values are, what's the margin of error, so that you can still report that in, in your study, right? In your write up. You want to be able to report that, you know, so hey, we, we couldn't change the sample size. This is all we could do for whatever external reasons, right? And here's how you can interpret our, our findings, right? Our, our sample is only representative of the entire population of, of, that's relevant here within this margin of error, right? However large or small it might be, right? But it's useful to say that because as a reader, then I can, you know, I can see um, how likely is it that whatever you're reporting may hold for uh, the larger population that's relevant, right? And, you know, it's okay, it's okay. I, I mean, ideally you do this ahead of time and sample as many as you need, but if for whatever reason you cannot, it's still useful to, to compute the margin of error, right? Because you wanna be able to uh, reason about how generalizable your um, measurements are. Okay, cool. So we talked about this. Okay, so uh, we talked about this too. So um, not much to, to add here about what non-response error means. One, one thing worth mentioning. So obviously um, you, you could probably imagine this, the higher the response rate, right? So uh, let's say you invite a thousand people, the more of those people respond to your survey, the, the the better and the lower your non-response error should be, right? So not uh, to remind you, non-response error occurs when the people that haven't responded are somehow fundamentally different from the people that have. Okay, so you know the more people respond, the the, the better in general it is, and the lower therefore your non-response error should be because um, there's less uncertainty about the the people that haven't responded yet, right? The more people respond, but um, interestingly, um, this is not is not guaranteed, right? So you cannot you cannot assume this. Like, on average, this this tends to hold, but you cannot assume this. And uh, there's some uh, studies sort of showing um, showing in more details of why that is and and how um, non-response error may still be very high in studies in surveys that have very high response rates. Which is counterintuitive, right? So that, that's kind of the thing worth remembering here, and you can look this up. Um, okay, yeah. So measurement error was about whether whatever you're asking actually captures sufficiently accurately the concept that you're interested in measuring. So here's what one example. Let's say you're interested in measuring the um, Household wealth as some variable of uh, socioeconomic status. Household wealth is the construct, the concept you're interested in measuring. And you're operationalizing this as the household income for the previous year uh, in the, for that family. Okay. So, like one scenario in which this may be highly inaccurate is um, 
if people have just retired, okay, because their um, annual income is likely to have decreased substantially once they've retired, but not their wealth, right? They still um, own whatever properties and investments and whatever else they might have by then. Okay, but you can see here, so just one, one example of how um, this variable of household income may uh, not actually capture the concept, the construct you're really interested in, which is wealth. Okay? And in the same way, you can imagine countless examples like this. So this is about the validity of the construct or the measurement. Okay, so these, these were the four uh, types of errors, right? So coverage error, sampling error, non-response error, and uh, what was the fourth one? Measurement error. Measurement error, thank you, yes. So, okay, so these are the errors. So, you know, when you're designing surveys and survey instruments, like keep these in mind uh, as you're doing this. So let me show you one example uh, of how um, to think about getting more people to respond, right? So uh, you've seen that getting more people to respond to your survey is a, in general, a, a useful defense mechanism against some of these errors that we just talked about. Okay? So here's an example of um, a survey of 600 PhD students done at Washington State University, uh, I don't know, some eight years ago. Um, about their uh, dissertation work and about their graduate training. And uh, this is a great example of um, how um, you could think about getting more people to respond to reduce the incidence of some of these uh, errors that would affect your, your results and your conclusions. So check this out. So on the x-axis here, is it's time, is the timeline of events uh, that, that have happened here. Uh, and on the y-axis is the response rate. So here they knew their population of interest. They knew exactly um, how many, um, th their population of interest uh, consisted of PhD students at Washington State University. Their sampling frame, well, is there any coverage error here? Should we be worried about coverage error, do you think? It depends on if they're making claims about Washington State University students or university students in general. I, I believe Washington State University students in particular. So I'm going to argue no. I'm going to argue the cover. Sorry, the, the sampling frame here is the uh, is the entire population of students of interest. Right? They have they have records. They know exactly who is enrolled as a PhD student at Washington State University whenever they did the study. They have access to all of those records. They know exactly who, who every member of the population is, uh, and they can. Um, sample their uh, uh, participants from among the entire population. Their sampling frame consists of the entire population. So there's little risk of coverage error here because we don't have secret PhD students that nobody knows about that might be fundamentally different from the ones that I'm um, including in, this, in the sampling frame. Does that make sense? I. I here I can literally enumerate the population, the members of the population. In my example from the beginning, when I talked about um, surveying or being interested in making claims about open source developers in general, but um, compiling a sampling frame of GitHub open source users, right? That's problematic because of all the other open source developers that are not on GitHub potentially, right? If, if they turn out to be fundamentally different. Okay, but here we don't have that problem because we can literally enumerate every member of the population of interest. Okay, so coverage uh, errors is, is not a problem, but the other things are. So here's, here's what it did. So it's really fascinating. Uh, so how they set this up. Um, it started with um, a letter 
in the mail, in the snail mail, in an envelope, a USPS mail, a letter um, inviting the students to participate in the survey. Um, and the this was the letter. The letter so described, um, it was just an invitation to participate in the survey, it contained um, um, the link to the survey itself and contained this access code, whatever, that um, so some unique identifier to uh, trace back the responses to, to the person that um, they invited, okay? So they, they started with mail-in letters with printed URLs, right? That people couldn't click on. They had to like copy, type, they couldn't copy paste. There's no, this is not an electronic document, right? It was a mail-in letter. People had to copy the URL from the letter, type it into their computer and then go to this page, then copy paste the um, uh, access code and then fill in the survey, okay? This is how it started. Um, and they, um, they waited a few days and 8% of their students of interest responded already by then, okay? From this, from this letter. Then they sent out an email invitation. That's the second uh, milestone you see there. Sent out an email invitation reminding people um, of, so here, I have that too. Earlier this week, we sent you a letter asking for your help with an important survey. We're conducting this study of doctoral students to learn more about the processes they go through to complete their dissertations and finish their degrees. I'm following up with this email to provide you with an electronic link to the survey website. I hope this link makes it easier for you to respond. It should only take a few minutes to complete the questionnaire. Uh, simply click on this link and you'll be automatically logged into the survey. Um, and, and then there's a blurb at the end. The results of the study will help us better understand the needs and experiences of students as they work on their dissertation research. Your participation is very important and we appreciate you considering our request. Okay, this was the email that followed up. So this got them quite a bit more. Okay, you see a very effective uh, email invite was very effective. Uh, as you might expect, right? So people, you know, if you have to fill it in on your computer, then um, um, it's easier if it's already on your computer and your email, okay? Then, I don't know, a week later or something, they sent another email reminder telling people about this, these other things that they've uh, sent them. Like, hey, we sent you a letter and we sent you an email and you still haven't responded. You know, would you mind responding? Okay, and remember because they were tracking um, the, the people who responded with those unique codes, they were able to, I imagine, I haven't read the details, but I imagine they were able to only uh, spam with these reminders, the people that have yet to respond. They, you know, they already knew which people responded, so there's no need to spam those that have already responded, just the ones that have not yet. Then, uh, another week later, they sent out a paper version of the questionnaire by USPS mail again. To, to those people that haven't responded by that point either, okay? And finally, uh, I don't know, a few days later still, they send out a final email telling people that, you know, this is the final email, this is the final reminder, please respond and so on, if you haven't already. But so the um, take home message from this, look at how each one of these interventions um, contributed to the overall response rate, okay? So the, each one of these by themselves did something useful. Here you can see how um, the email as expected, the, the first email was the most effective, got them from 8% to 49% response rate. That was the most effective mechanism of, of recruiting participants. But literally everything else contributed to their overall response rate, including these paper uh, printouts of, of the survey instrument. Right? Really, really fascinating. Like 
hardly anyone goes through this much trouble in the normal uh, research studies that involve surveys. But but look look how effective they could be. Right? So in the end, they had uh, seventy seven percent response rate for um, this uh, population of six hundred PhD students at the university there, um, and. Um, if you've ever done surveys of any kind, you will quickly recognize how unusually high this is. The, the kinds of surveys that we often do with open source participants and whatnot uh, are closer to a 10% response rate than to an 80% response rate. So just to give you a sense of how uh, highly unusual and effective this was. Um, one thing I, I forgot to emphasize, let me go back a second. Okay, so um, in the original letter, right, the, the thing, the first thing they sent out um, with the link that people had to like type in their computers by hand, in that letter, they also enclosed $2. $2 bills, okay, as a token of appreciation. So uh, if you've read this, you probably haven't because I sort of flipped through it very quickly, but note, note the last sentence here in this uh, original letter it says, we very much appreciate your help with the study and a small token of appreciation is enclosed with this letter as a way of saying thank you. That small token of appreciation consisted of these $2 bills, okay? So you might think, you know, $2 bills is really that, is that high? If I paid you $2, would you like feel so much more inclined to do something for me? Like, obviously your time is worth more than that. Okay, sure. And this was, you know, it was a while ago, it was eight years ago, but it wasn't that long ago. I mean, uh, $2 eight years ago was still not a huge amount of money. So, so what do you think? What, what's the catch? I mean, uh, for me, I feel like I, I will be not comfortable taking anyone else's money without finishing the tasks they ask. And also it's very complicated for me to return that money as well. And I would not like to just drop it somewhere else. So I, I think by comparison, like comparing all the options I have, return the money, drop it out or finish the task. I think finish the task is the most easiest and the most viable option for me. But why not just like keep the money and not do the task? Because I will not be consciously comfortable with myself. Anybody else share this? I mean, it's just it's just two dollars. Well, I feel like um even if it's it's just two dollars, um it, it kind of help keep the uh, thing in your mind for a while. And that definitely helps with uh, later on when they sign the email uh, reminders, um, it, it would help that um, to basically just motivate you more to, to fill out the survey when they actually send those survey again and again. So here's um, a super cool um, study uh, showing experimentally the, the value, the impact of doing something like this. This was a study an experiment done in uh, in Russia, and so here were the conditions. They they were um, recruiting people to participate in this in a survey. They had a control group of people um, that they offered no incentive to. They they had a first uh, so treatment group, um, if you will, um, of people that they offered fifty rubles to. So this is approximately $1.65 uh, also in 2013. So I guess, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, and 
they, it was the same idea. They enclosed, they attached this money to the survey invitation somehow. They, they offered the money, they paid this money in advance before people responded, okay? Uh, and another treatment group, but you, you might um, wonder about the, the monetary value here. Like, you know, my, maybe my first reaction was, I don't know, like two dollars. I don't know. Maybe it's too small. But what if they, what if they had paid me a hundred or something, right? That I'd be much more likely to, you know, to consider this if the value was was greater, right? You you could think. So they tried that. They had a third group um, that they promised six times as much money. So still not a huge amount, but just, you know, more more than the um, the original. Uh, if the questionnaire was returned, this was money promised should you return the questionnaire not paid in advance, okay? And these were like randomly assigned, people were randomly assigned to these conditions and whatnot, so like, you know, true experimental uh, design, okay? Guess what happened? The second group has the highest response rate? Mm. Very close. So in the no incentive group, 10% responded. By the way, 10% is what we get with our open source surveys um, that we often um, don't uh, pay people to, to respond to. So this sort of confirms my experience with, with surveys. Uh, the prepaid group, they had 37% response rate. Okay, look how much higher that was compared to the baseline. The higher value, but not in hand, right? The sort of promised money uh, group was lower still than this. Still higher than the baseline, the control group. Right? So there's some value there, but lower than the prepaid money. Um, and finally, they had a condition where they combined the prepaid and the postpaid. So they, they offered people the 50 rubles ahead of time and they promised them another 300 should they return the survey. And, and this was the most effective. So they're combining the pre and post paid um, flavors of this had the highest response rate. But so look how they went from 10% to almost 50% response rate by, by doing this. Okay. And this is, uh, I haven't read the original study. I've read the book's uh, summary and description of the original study. So, you know, to take this for, uh, for what it's worth and with a grain of salt. Um, I don't have a firsthand uh, knowledge of all the details of the study, the original study, but this looks really solid to me as, uh, you know, if it's a true experiment uh, with random assignment to these uh, groups, it looks really solid. The evidence is very compelling to me. So th this is why the $2 wow. in the mail, sorry. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, does this actually apply? Because um, in the letter there, so they were only sampling PhD students. And in the letter they mentioned, we're working with the NSF. So PhD students who know the money's coming from the NSF might feel a little less guilty or <laughs> be less inclined than uh, say a member of the general population. Less guilty to take the money and not respond. The money might be less effective on PhD students who understand how NSF funding works and uh, that it is grant money rather than the general population who might, mm -hmm. you know, uh, might assume that it's the researchers' money. For example. Yeah, I, I I agree with the general. I think you're saying um, there's probably all kinds of like uh, modern might... variables that change the impact of this, the effect of this. And yeah. I totally agree with this. It could be could be cultural. It could be context. It could be all kinds of things. I, I completely agree. I I haven't looked more into this. I I imagine there would be more studies exploring those, but I just I haven't I haven't had a chance to look at, at that at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm not making any claims or suggesting that it would be different, but it's kind of interesting to consider that it might be. Right, fun. So um, this, of all of these things, um, fit under this um, theory of social exchange. So this is, um, 
the book goes into a lot more detail than uh, I'll be able to cover here, but this is the main idea that, um, so the theory here is of social exchange, and that means that people are more likely to comply with some request that you would make um, if they believe and trust that the rewards for complying with that request uh, will eventually exceed the costs of complying. So this doesn't have to be um, immediate, doesn't have to be an immediate tangible benefit, but there, there has to be this uh, belief that the eventual rewards, either personal to themselves or to general, just to advancing science and whatever uh, knowledge, if, if that might be the case, uh, that those um, outweigh the costs of complying and uh, participating in the survey, for example, the characters. So now, um, these are, you can see here, right? So if, if, if you believe the social exchange theory and mechanism, that means as you're designing instruments, so back to the story. Um, if you believe this theory and, and, and you know, this mechanism, then what this means for you as designers of surveys and survey instruments is that you have so two levers to, to act on. Uh, one is increasing the benefit that people might get from participating, right? So that means, you know, either the benefit direct benefit to themselves you know maybe you can incentivize them directly with something that benefits them immediately or maybe just the you know the overall research problem your study is in, is on such an important topic that people will just will be so naturally inclined to participate right so you know, all of these are variables but the, you can act on the benefits and um maybe um Maybe only to a limited extent, right? You, you know, let's say you don't have much choice on, on, on how important the problem is perceived by the people uh, you're uh, looking to survey, or you could act on the costs. Okay, so I'm going to spend the rest of uh, this lecture uh, sort of talking about some of the costs and how to reduce those, right? How to make it easier for people to respond to surveys. Oops. Um, right, so we talked about benefits a little bit. Um, okay, a few, a few tips and tricks here. One is, if, um, if your request for people to participate in your survey is uh, a request for help, if you're asking for help, if you're framing it in such a way that you're, it seems like you're asking them for help, um, right? Um, then that's that's useful, right? Because people feel good about helping others. So just a natural human reaction. So if they perceive participating as as helpful to you um, or to the project, uh, they're more likely to respond. And um, to go back to this letter I had uh, and the email reminder and so on, I showed you as examples earlier, you'll see how they are very explicit about how helpful it will be if the people actually participate in the survey. So that's, that's one tip here. Um, another tip, you've probably seen this, I find it super annoying how, uh, I don't know, like websites, they, I get these pop-ups saying, I have been chosen uh, to participate in a survey to give feedback on uh, improving the platform or whatever. I have been chosen. It is an honor, but right? it's, it's not that anybody has a chance to participate in this, not that anybody can be selected to, to fill out a survey to uh, improve whatever random website, right? But I have been chosen. Uh, I, I've earned this privilege, or I, I have the luck of being one of the select few people to participate in this, right? Like, why do you think, have you, have you seen those? Have you had those? Yeah, right? Why do you think they designed them like this? Because there's research showing that um, like scarcity, um, like either the real uh, or perceived uh, 
real reality or perception that only some people can can participate and respond, right? That makes people more likely to respond. So that it's a trick. They're, they're tricking you to, to respond this way. You're more likely to respond if it seems like um, not everybody had that chance that you were offered. Uh, so that can be applied here as well. Uh, and I, I think we talked about most of the other ones. So I'm not going to go in more details here. Uh, right, okay, so obviously to, to reduce the cost, this is the other lever that you have control over, to reduce the cost, um, it really matters how you formulate your questions, right? So it has to be, the, the survey as a whole has to be short, has to be easy to answer. Uh, we'll see uh, more examples in a minute. Uh, but so interesting, so this is one point I wanted to emphasize. Uh, it was very surprising to me when I read this. Interestingly, yeah, if you give people a choice of modes to respond through, that's actually counterproductive. So, for, for example, uh, the, uh, for the longest time, uh, we have, um, when we invite people over for interviews, we offer them the choice to um, uh, have a, I don't know, Zoom or Skype call with us or respond via chat or uh, respond via email or whatever. That's sort of an example of, uh, of offering multiple choice, multiple modes of responding. In the previous uh, PhD student survey uh, we talked about, that, that would be responding by mail, right? You get this sort of physical printout of the survey instrument and you fill it in with a pencil or pen or whatever and you mail it back versus responding electronically, right? So th this would be giving people a choice um, of modes to respond. Doing that actually may reduce the response rate. It's super interesting. And why do you think that is? Because people don't like to make choice? Yes, because of the extra cognitive burden with having to make a decision. If you, if I have to, it's the same as choosing what to eat for dinner. Right? If I have to decide, it's, it's, it's perceived as taxing, right? It's a high cognitive burden to make this additional decision. I'm, I'm already tired. I don't have the energy to make this extra decision. So um, notice how in the previous uh, PhD student survey, they um, did not offer uh, people a choice of modes simultaneously, right? So they didn't start their uh, survey, uh, the, the invitation letter um, they sent out in the beginning did not include also a physical copy of the survey instrument of the questionnaire. It only included this link to the website. So no choice of modes given there, right? They only offered this additional mode later after people have not responded, after people were given enough time to respond to the original mode, okay? So the alternative would have been to start by offering both modes from the beginning. You could have mailed them the questionnaire, printed out, and you could have pasted the URL in, in your letter and you could have given people the choice to either return the questionnaire on paper or to go to that URL and fill it in electronically, right? That would have been giving them a choice of modes and that would have been worse. So su super uh, counterintuitive and surprising to me when I, when I learned this, okay? Uh, okay. So yeah, th these are obvious. You can read more about this in the book. This is uh, sort of a, a visualization of uh, the, the things we, I just mentioned. So, um, you know, like establishing this foundation of trust is kind of at the, at the core of everything. That doesn't, you have to do that anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not a lever, that's not an option. But then you have this choice of reducing the costs or increasing the benefits and, you know, ideally both, right, that, that you can act on. Okay. so. 
here's some uh, issues to consider as you're designing questions, as you're formulating questions. So this one's super interesting, social desirability bias. Have you heard this before? We talked about this a little bit in the context of interviews. So this creeps up there as well, creeps up in, in, in surveys, creeps up everywhere. The idea is that um, people want to make a good impression and they are more likely, when in public, they're more likely to engage in socially desirable behavior, right? To do things that are considered socially desirable and, and acceptable and less likely to admit or, or publicly do things that are uh, the opposite. You know, so, uh, Sam, you're one of your uh, older projects, the nose-picking project, right? That was kind of the idea there too. That's sort of a, an extension of the metaphor there. So here's some evidence uh, for this, super interesting. So for example, um, they, it was an, an old survey um, asking people uh, how often they drive after uh, drinking alcoholic beverages. How often do they drive under influence? Uh, frequently, occasionally, seldom, never, or don't know. And these were the answer options. So when there was a person, an, an interviewer, uh, administering this survey over the phone, 63% okay, of respondents said never. When the people were uh, given this instrument and uh, so they were able to, they, were, they could fill it in on their own without somebody sort of engaging with them and watching them. Okay, when they were able to do that on their own, 52% responded never. Okay, and these were uh, set up in such a way that, um, so again, you know, random assignment and so on, and all of these experimental uh, uh, design things that, that make this um, trustworthy, hopefully. Okay. So the idea being that um, the presence of this human interviewer asking these questions, okay, forced people into um, displaying more of this socially desirable behavior, right? Like um, fewer people were willing to admit that they engaged in this bad behavior, right? When an, another human was watching them because of, because it's socially undesirable, it would be, uh, I don't know, be shameful, right? To admit to this. If you're on your own, you're more likely to admit to this, right? Because nobody's watching you. See? So that's that's the idea. This happens a lot in interviews, happens in surveys too, uh, especially in interviews. Um, Pardon? Yep, Carl. Yeah, uh, so I guess, how do we know that we don't chalk up the difference, the I guess the 52 to 63% with the margin of error and the confidence? Ah. Uh, yeah, good question. I yes, that's a great question. I I would have to look at the original study. So hopefully, um, hopefully they talk about that uh, in the original paper, the one that I'm citing here. Um, I don't I don't know. I haven't had a chance to read the original source, and the book doesn't talk about that, so I, I don't know. I think I think your question is right, though. Um, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that they factored that in, factored that in. Uh, and that's the margin of error is much lower than the difference here uh, for, for this to still hold. But I think you're right. That's a great comment. Thank you. I, I don't know. So, okay, here's another one. Uh, more of the same. If you ask people, how would you describe your current health? Excellent, good, fair, or poor? Okay. Fewer respondents choose excellent in a self-administered survey compared to a, an interviewer administered survey okay why do you think that is because so think about um, so typical american culture the conventional greeting when you meet anyone strangers in the in the store that you've never talked to before people are uh, open up with hi how are you that's a conventional greeting right 
and, and North American culture, right? And what are you going to say? Are you going to say, like, oh, I'm drowning uh, in, like, stress and, and I'm overwhelmed with everything and the pandemic and I hate my life and whatever? Are you going to say that? Probably not, right? You're probably going to say, yeah, I'm fine. How are you? Right? So because of this, um, because it's a human, right? It's a human asking you this question, probably not going to like, bother, um, you know, admitting to these things that, um, make you unhappier or whatever it might be. The same here for health, right? You're less likely to admit that your health is in a poorer condition than it really is if it's a person asking you, because it'd, it'd be more of the same. That's the idea. Uh, and there's many more of these. Um, people denying having received failing grades in college when asked by a, a human interviewer compared to uh, when when filling out a survey on their own, um, people uh, less likely to admit to engaging in extramarital sex when being interviewed by a same-sex interviewer compared to when being interviewed by an opposite-sex interviewer, and many, many more. There's tons of these in the book, and I'm sure you can find tons of these elsewhere. So this is a very sort of well-documented bias. Um, another one is acquiescence. This has to do with the tendency to agree with someone rather than disagree. And I think we talked about this a little bit too in the context of interviews. So um, here, here's one example of that. Right, so note how um, this is essentially the same question phrased in, in sort of opposite ways. So here, respondents were asked to agree with the statement, individuals are more to blame than social conditions for crime and lawlessness in this country. 60% okay? of people agree. If you flip the question around, the, the state, sorry, the statement around, and uh, phrase it as social conditions are more to blame than individuals for crime and lawlessness in this country, right? You're flipping the two uh, things. Then 57% of uh, the control group agree. And again, with Kyle's uh, reservations from earlier, let, let's assume that uh, the margin of errors is much smaller uh, here. But what this suggests uh, is that these both can't be true at the same time, right? That they would add up to more than 100%. So uh, this is, so it would indicate that some people would just agree with this because of how you phrase the question, not because they so truly believe that. Does that make sense? So this is called acquiescence. Um, right, this is, let me, um, let me skip this because we're kind of running short on time, I guess. I guess yeah. Let me let me stop here, and we can maybe finish this when we meet on uh, on Thursday, and I'll pick this up there. We have what two minutes left? Does it run until three forty normally or three fifty? Three forty. Yeah. Yeah. So let let me stop here. I always keep you uh, over time, so let me at least this time uh, and uh, on time or, or slightly early. We'll, we'll pick this up on Thursday. Oh. I, I, Bogdan, just uh, just a question for the uh, agreement. Uh, yeah, th this this experiment. I wonder if there's any experiment that has like disagree, like if they have like two reversed um, statement, and they ask like whether they disagree with it. Um, yes, um, I actually have some data about this. Um, I will post a slide deck uh, today so you could so. You, you could look at that. And actually, if you just look at the book, um, if you look at the book, which is already um, in, the, in the Google Drive folder, you'll find lots of examples of that too. But I'll have in the remainder of the slide deck some more examples of how um, the order of answers in, in the question and so all of these things change drastically the kinds of data that you're able to collect. Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. There, there's a lot of other, um, variables that have a huge impact on these uh, estimates that you'd be collecting, uh, such as the one you mentioned. Thanks. 
we'll see more on Thursday, but um, and you can see more in the book still. Uh, I had a question for um, next Tuesday. Is there a specific format that you wanted us to follow for it or? Um... Right, good. So um, I would, um, let me go back to, uh, I, I don't remember where I wrote that up, but I, I, I wrote that up somewhere. Um, expectations for probably being the intro lecture, expectations for the project proposal, I think in the intro lecture. So um, good look there and I, I'll double check. The format doesn't, I don't care about the format of, you know, like slide design or anything like this. I, I don't care about any of that, but I, um, I'd like you to touch on the components that I, that I listed there. So you know, what are the research questions and, and things like this? Um, and I have to go back and check what the components are exactly, what, what literature you're looking to draw from uh, and so on. And when, rough idea of how you're planning to uh, to approach this like overall overview of the study design even if you don't have you know specific um, methods or instruments or data just yet but kind of an overview of how you're looking to approach this so uh, I, i've written those down i think in the first lecture um and uh, I'll, I'll double check and send those um, through slack or, or otherwise thanks so just as long as you touch on, on the components, it doesn't matter how you design it. Well, thank you everyone. I'll see you on Thursday, hopefully with better sound then.